feel the floor, which I Professor Cook. In the hybrid system, and this one is ions and quantum shots. So, thanks for coming so late. Uh, I hope you don't fall asleep. Um, but I must say, a part of challenges already getting <coughs> people who were tired of those. Uh, last summer, after the soccer World Cup final, I had to lecture late in the morning. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> so, I think we'll make it through this. Right. So, um, yes, yeah, so today, today I want to show you um, some experiments, some progress we made on making hybrid quantum systems between uh, solid state, uh, individual solid state systems, individual solid state emitters, and single atomic systems, maybe ions and and um, the, the main motivation for this work is um, come or comes from the, from the concept of the quantum networks um, that, that Jörg was already introducing yesterday. And uh, this picture is stolen from <coughs> this paper where um, two years ago, three years ago now almost, they built the first elementary um, quantum network where they had two um, neutral atoms, one here, one here, each um, located in a high finesse optical cavity. And these two cavities were linked with single mode optical fiber, <coughs> providing <coughs> a platonic link between these individual systems. So this was a, a rubidium atom here, um, and um, a rubidium atom here, so same species of atoms. And they could demonstrate rather efficiently um, the uh, teleportation between the states, the joint creation of entanglement of two particles which are like 20, 20 meters um, apart from each other. And um, this is basically considered to be the first um, building block of um, possibly larger structures and <coughs> depicted up there what their, what their vision is for these experiments of larger networks where individual uh, quantum systems can communicate with each other and one can study how entanglement can be spread out and distributed um, in such networks, for example. There have been some experiments uh, previously and at the same time, so there were experiments with, with pairs of ions without the cavity, so just ions in free space, and these two ions were entangled by the coincidence detection of the photons emitted from these ions. Um, there were experiments also with atoms in free space at the same time as this, as this work by Rempel um, in the group of Harald Weinfurter. And uh, more recently, there were also experiments with NV centers um, in, in the Netherlands, um, also without the cavity with free space emission from the centers. And basically, this, this is, it goes all into the direction of, of building um, small networks of, of uh, quantum emitters which can be coupled together. So far, the, the focus in this business has always been on identical systems. I think for an obvious reason, because um, if you want to link two of these together, um, this is just much, much easier if you have a perfect bandwidth match between these two. So the photons emitted from one, for sure, can be absorbed by the other. Um, what I will show you today are, are our attempts at um, building something like this, but in a hybrid configuration where we have one atomic system here and one solid state system on the other side. And um, the motivation for this basically is, as for, for many of the, the hybrid works, is that we hope that we can build on um, the, the individual strengths of these different systems so that we can use, for example, the ions as very good memories <coughs> for information because they have very long coherence times. Indeed, the, um, in hyperfine states have coherent times on the order of half an hour to an hour. Um, whereas the uh, solid state parts, in this, in this case semiconductor quantum dots, they have very good electric optical interfacing, of course, and very fast manipulation uh, capabilities, so on, on picosecond time scales. So this is what we, what we would like to see here. i so just talked about this. Um, but of course, this faces quite a few challenges. Um, these are probably just a few um, of the things that one has to consider or has to think about when, when, when one sets up an experiment like this. So the first question, of course, is which interaction do we want to use between two very different systems? 
Um, do you do this in the near field? Then you have a lot of choices. It can be magnetic coupling. I will show examples of, of this in a moment. It can be the magnetic coupling, could be electric coupling, could even be plasmonic coupling, um, which is of also electric, but it's slightly different. Or it could be mechanical coupling. We heard about this in the uh, often mechanics a bit. If you go to the far field, so if you want to transport this information over long distances, then I think the the usual approach would be to do this optically, because um, simply for the reason that you can carry photons about relatively large distances without uh, too much loss. And then, but then even if you do this, opt have this optical link, you still have to convert it back, and then have this interacting with your images. The next big question, of course, is the, the resonance frequency problem, or basically how do you match these two um, systems together? Um, on the one hand, there are atoms. Atoms have um, very discrete lines in their spectrum. This can be optical or microwave um, transitions. Um, these lines are very well known, and they are, they are, they are essentially always the same uh, for every uh, atom of the system. <coughs> so basically, if we, as soon as we have atoms, in the problem, basically, the resonance frequencies are, are set by the, by, by the species that you're using. In the solid, um, there's probably more choice. I mean, there are there are color centers. Uh, we heard about the NVs, for example. There, there are quantum dots and in semiconductors. Um, and uh, all of these um, have relatively good optical properties, but yet not quite comparable to to atomic systems because they are recoupled to a lot of uh, uh, processes in the in the solid. So you can couple to phonons. We have heard that the, um, for example, for, for the NV centers, um, you can at, at room temperatures get a lot of emission into uh, photon drawn <coughs> uh, or shifted side plans. Strain can shift these uh, transition frequencies around. So even if you have um, two identical or you think you have two identical samples. Depending on the on the internal structure of the crystal, they can have still rather uh, different emission properties, and uh, so these are the things you have to fight here. And if you want to bring them together, you have to come up with a way how you can overcome this. And finally, there is the bandwidth problem um, that is um, very. I mean, this is basic, basically the problem that that's in all um, communications. When when you have want to have two emitters talking to each other. They should not only talk at the same frequency, but they also should talk in the same bandwidth so that you can efficiently communicate with them. And um, here's, here's the problem. So for atoms, this is usually on the order of megahertz, and for, for solids, this is on the order of gigahertz. So roughly, there's a, a factor of thousands uh, mismatch in bandwidth. So when you emit a photon from here, um, there's only, so if you just divide this by each other, just a thousand probability that this can actually be absorbed, even if the center frequencies are matching exactly. So these are all the problems, and I will show you in this lecture today um, how they can be solved. There has been work um, in the past uh, few years, basically since 2010 more or less, where people have gone into this direction of, of building um, hybrid quantum systems um, and uh, interacting these, these systems together. This is probably an incomplete list here, but the, the first work that I would like to mention here is um, the, uh, the absorption of uh, the emission of, of semiconductor quantum dots in, in rubidium vapor. Um, so basically, what they what they took is a nickel gallium arsenide uh, semiconductor quantum dot, uh, where the emission wavelength was tuned to near 780 nanometers. Sent this to a to a rubidium vapor cell, and then you can see that um, these photons can be absorbed. Of course, in the vapor cell, the, the rubidium spectrum is broadened a lot by the Doppler effect uh, at room temperature. So this helps this because you have a relatively wide spectrum where you can absorb, but nevertheless, this was the first uh, significant achievement here um, in combining atoms and, and solid states. Then there was the recent experiment uh, last year where um, experiments were done with the emission of, of single molecules. Um, so these were these detached molecules which were uh, immersed into a matrix. And you see here already the problem when you work with molecules, because this is the emission spectrum of the molecule. Mm -hmm. Right, so now you can go there and then try to single out a single uh, line, which corresponds to a single uh, row vibronic transition um, in the molecule. And they did that, and they found that there are 
these lines which coincide basically with the um, D2 line um, uh, and the D1 line in the <coughs> sodium vapor. So they could show that the, the emission of the molecules can indeed be absorbed in, uh, in sodium vapor. So similar, similar to here, um, but focusing on, on single transitions uh, in these molecules. So what, what was the nature of the, of the excitation of the molecule? Is it vibrational or is it an electronic excitation or what? what these are, these are electronic excitations of the molecule. And, and the, 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 the manifold that you see here, they correspond to these row electronic bands for the different electronic excitations. Can I think of it as the molecule acting as a pretty small quantum dot? Yes. 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 If, this, if this would be a, a simple molecule, like whatever, H2, let's say, then you would have very nice, uh, very nice <coughs> emission lines. And as soon as you go to larger molecules, what they appear, you embed it into a matrix, and you can go more into the quantum dot world, where you have then the coupling to, to all degrees of freedom in the matrix where you embed it also. And then this gives you these large sort of lines. Yes. And then, last but not least, there are the um, experiments, uh, probably even more than what I've mentioned here, where um, and these centers are coupled to superconducting qubits. Um, as far as I know, these are not yet single MD centers, but these are ensembles. But uh, you're probably more experts here can correct me. They're ensembles. Sorry, ensembles. Yes, okay. Um, so, um, this is, I think, more or less the, the state of the art um, in this business. And um, so, what I want to show you now in, in, in this lecture first is how we prepare the iron um, to, to be ready for this. So, building up on the first lecture. Um, and then I will show you the quantum dot, and then we can combine them together. So that's the outline. And uh, yeah, so in order to build an efficient flight matter interface, we employ gravity acuity. I mean, this is uh, straightforward, of course, where um, a single atomic emitter, a single line, is embedded into a high penis optical cavity. It's a standing wave cavity, as depicted here. And um, the, the physics of interaction of the single emitter with the with the mode is uh, basically electric dipole interaction uh, with a coupling constant G. So that's, that's here. The dynamic coming so we'll call it the excitation operator of the ion destruction of the gravity photon and vice versa. That is the coherent part of the interaction that we're interested in. These are just the, the bare the energy of the, the gravity photon and the internal structure um, of the atom model that is the And then you're fighting <laughs> the two rates. K rate, one decay rate is out into other vacuum modes outside the cavity mode, that's at the rate gamma, and there is the decay rate of the cavity field. This is the rate that we would like to have high because we want to extract uh, photons from the, the quantum field. So we don't want to go, to go really into the strong coupling regime where the photon lives forever in this cavity because then we don't have any signal. <coughs> Nevertheless, the other thing that we want to have large is G. Uh, this this coherent coupling strength, which is basically the dipole moment um, of the of the atomic transition, times the electric field of a single photon inside the cavity, and um, this scales like the dipole moment divided by the square root of the mode volume um, of the cavity. So um, you see from this immediately, well, the dipole moment is basically given by the by the atomic structure. The only handle that we have is on the mode volume of the cavity, which means we have to build cavities with a small small mode volume in order to get this coherent coupling string up. And traditionally, this has been a problem. And um, the problem is now a bit specific, maybe to, to ion traps, but the problem is that ions are very sensitive to anything that you bring nearby, in particular if it's dielectric. And the reason for this is um, the, the manipulation of the ions is done with laser light, um, and if you shine the laser light on dielectrics, you charge up the dielectrics to the photon effect. And this distorts the trapping potentials a lot. And after a short while, trapping of these ions um, is impossible. So this is data thrown together from all ion groups uh, around the world, where you look at the, the, the noise spectrum uh, of the, on the ion from fluctuating <coughs> head charges, basically, on the electrodes, add a function to the ion electrode distance and the scaling law that is predicted that goes like d to the minus 4. So the, the, um, the noise on the ion which eventually heats the ion out of the trap is 
scales with one over the distance between ion and electrodes to the fourth power. So this is a very strong scaling, and this is even the scaling for the electrodes. So this is for metal surfaces. Dielectrics are even worse than that. So that's why usually the wisdom was that you cannot put um, ions very well in optical cavities because you would have to bring a big dielectric to a, to a distance of maybe 100 microns from the ion, and then the lifetime of the ion would be extremely short. On the other hand, if you want to do this with atoms, um, of course, you don't have the problem with the with dielectric surfaces because the atoms are neutral. However, the, the, the lifetime of an atom in such a in high in this cavity is only on the order of tens of seconds. So after a short while, the atom is gone simply because the, the trapping potentials are not as deep as an ion source. Okay, so this was the situation. And um, here is the way um, to overcome this. So basically, we set out to build the smallest possible cavity around the cell. And the smallest possible optical cavities that can, with the high finesse at least, that can be built at the moment, they're basically based on just n facets of single mode optical fibers. So you basically take a single mode optical fiber uh, of your preferred wavelength, and if you look at this from the front, it looks like this, it's 125 microns diameter, and here the bright spot you see is the core of this SM fiber, which is on the order of 4 to 5 microns. And now you have to make a, a nice concave mirror out of that. So what you do is you hit this very hard from the front with a CO2 as a pulse, and then this cavity, this fiber again starts melting and melts into a concave surface. This is a technique that was uh, invented and developed in Jakob Reichel Group in Paris, uh, and we're, we're collaborating with them. So after you have, you have, you have molten your, your, your mirror surface here, then you can put a highly dielectric coating on top. And um, by now we can build cavities which have a finesse in excess of, of 200,000 cavities. These are extremely good cavities, but they're, but they're tiny. Then you take two of these fibers, uh, you put them into some, some metallic sleeves, stainless steel sleeves for, for grounding and for, for shielding, put them face to face with a length of, in this case, 160 microns, and you can form cavities which are extremely short, extremely small, uh, but still have a high thickness. So in reality, in the real experiment, this looks approximately like this. Here are the two cavities and this small gap that you see here that is this 160 micron. So here's another impression of, all, of, the, of how the whole thing looks like. The, the pole trap, the eye trap is, is radically simplified in the setup. It just consists of two uh, tungsten um, electrodes which are etched to a very small tip with a radio curvature of a few microns at the very front. This forms the, the quadrupole potential, the ion is trapped right in the center here, and then from the left and from the right you put the, the, the fibers there and form the cavity around the ion. So this was, this was the plan basically. Here are some experimental pictures for those, for those of you who are interested. Uh, that's the, the electrodes here in the center, just these, these needles, here is the the optical microscope image, and around this there are some compensation um, electrodes. And so the strategy is to start with something like this, float an ion in here, and the cavity is on a mechanical translation state, and once the ion is trapped, the cavity just shifts over and is over that um, with the ion into it. Okay, and uh, this worked. Uh, here's the, 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 the image, which is a shadow picture of the, the electrodes, here and here, of the cavity from the side, and the fluorescence <laughs> of the single ion right in the middle here, interacting or overlapping with the cavity. And uh, so with this we can now go to the regime that we can build very small um, cavities, combine them with the ion traps, and now we have the best of the, of the two worlds here, that we can cavity QED with uh, particles which are trapped here for really long. So this lives in there for half an hour to an hour and can interact with the cavity. All right, so this is the level scheme you've seen before. It's the turbine plus level scheme. Again, here's the, the, the strong SDP transition that we use for detection and manipulation. And um, our cavity now runs on this transition up here. So from, from this, these three half states to this state here at 935 nanometers. So why have you chosen that um, transition? Um, the reason basically is that for, for these wavelengths, there are good fibers, there are good coatings, and uh, it's easy 
easier to build cavities than uh, in the other pilots. Plus, we have a nice lambda level system where we can pump out from the ground state with laser light near clear the and have a, a cavity stimulated Raman transition, which can generate, for example, a single photon out from the cavity. And then we can detect everything again with fluorescent distribution. So if this process is successful, then the population ends up here, and we see no fluorescence here. And if this transition is not successful, then the population stays here, and we see right transition. Sorry, this was too fast. Okay, so what's now the, the first characterization that we, that we did? Uh, well, we simply put the iron into the cavity, um, put some light through the cavity mode, and then move the cavity around. And with this we can really map out the cavity field using the single iron as a detector um, for the cavity light. Let me just go back and forth. So basically, we prepare the eye in this state, put this light into the cavity mode externally with the laser, and see whether we can pump the eye backwards um, on this transition with the, with the cavity field. And the, the rate for this process that is shown here in this false color plot, and you see here the rate is the highest, so that's the center of the mode, and then the mode falls off um, like, a nice, uh, like a nice Gaussian, and uh, the waste of the Gaussian is on the order of 5 microns, which is what we expected from our uh, cavity parameters. So that's basically fixed by the rates of curvature of the mirrors and the distance between the mirrors. And this provides a nice uh, coupling and a nice look uh, the, the localization of the ion between the mirrors is, uh, is relatively good. And we can see the localization. Um, on this plot here, now we move the, the ion relative to the cavity along the direction of the standing wave, and we can sample the standing wave. Um, inside the cavity, and this tells us basically how well the ion is localized, which is on the order of 100 microns. Uh, this is a bit bigger than we expected. Um, we don't know exactly why that is the case. We expected roughly a factor of two less, which would bring us to a significantly higher contrast. Um, it's something we still have to work out why um, why the ion seems to be spread over a larger range than the temperature of the ion would suggest. But nevertheless, we can resolve the the standing wave structure in this direction, and we can sort of resolve the Gaussian in the transverse direction, so we can really characterize the, the cavity mode extremely well with our single eye. Okay, and then the, the last part of the characterization is to measure the, the coupling strength, this, this parameter G of the, the, the James Cummings mode. Um, and this basically works in the way that you that you measure the percent effect. So you measure how strong this transition here um, is basically enhanced by the presence of the cavity mode on this transition. And uh, this, the, the Purcell factor basically is directly the capital strength of the cavity. So we pre-drive this drama transition here, one in one case, with the cavity uh, not present. And we continuously monitor how the decay of this state is, then we get this decay. And um, if we put the cavity on resonance with this transition, then we see we depopulate this state down here faster like this, which is just the Purcell enhancement of this lambda transition by the cavity. And from this then we can quantitatively extract how big its coupling rate is, which is 3 megahertz. And this basically sets the, the internal quantum dynamics inside the cavity. Okay, so this is basically the, the characterization of these, of these tiny cavities, which we for the first time uh, combined here with the to the trapped ions. And um, now we have to see what we can do about the, the photonic properties of the ion and the cavity. So basically, we want now to create single photons out of this, or we want to absorb single photons with the ion. So the procedure for this is, is again in the level scheme, we prepare the ion in this D3 half state here. Then we shine in a short, two nanosecond, I think, uh, laser pulse um, on the 935 nanometer position. But now, not on the cavity mode, but from the side. And um, excite the atom to the state up here, and then a uh, photon can be emitted back into the cavity mode, and this photon then leaves out in this direction. Alternatively, of course, there could be a decay down here, which is sort of the, the case that there is not, not, not the successful production of this photon. This, this, uh, this, this unsuccessful process we can observe with this heralding 
uh, here on the 360 nanometer, nanometer transition, and you just throw them out. But in the other cases where the photon is generated, this transition remains dark. So we get the photons out, we put them in a Henry Brown twist setup, look at the Henry Brown twist correlations, and we can indeed confirm that we get single photons out. It's not a big surprise, it's a single emitter in there, uh, which is excited for the shortcuts. The uh, efficiency of this, the total efficiency of this is 2%, which means that um, for every uh, attempt, um, we have a sort of, out of 100 attempts to, to, to pulse on this laser, we get two photons out uh, into the single mode uh, fiber, which is a relatively high number, because the branching ratio here is relatively unfavorable. We get a lot of decays down here, which contribute most to this decay. To this, to this uh, percent, um, but uh, two percent coupling into a single mode fiber from a single quantum meter itself is not that bad. We can then also study the uh, the temporal chain of the photons generated. Um, <coughs> so basically, same procedure as here um, with the, with a fast switch, and then we time resolve um, on the APD um, the photon arrivals and. Uh, this is the, basically the, the shape that we're getting out. The photon is around 100 nanoseconds um, long, and this provides us more or less with the measurement of the, of the kappa of the KRT line width, because this determines the, the rate at which the photons can be extracted. So this gives us sort of the, the last bit of characterization um, of the KRT. Now, so this was all assuming that we have a two level system here. Of course, this is not true. Uh, in fact, um, with the lower state is four folds degenerate, and with the upper state um, is two folds degenerate. So strictly speaking, we now also have to take care of the polarizations of the photons coming out, and how they are correlated with the spin states of the ions. So um, basically, we want to see that um, the polarization state of the photon coming out here is correlated with the spin state of the ion that is left behind after that process. And uh, we do this in the following way. Uh, we, we, by optical pumping, prepare all the population in this lowest state of the D-manifold, which we call the down state. Then we shine it again, this laser from the side, with a very short sigma plus polarized excitation pulse, which goes up here to the excited state. And from this excited state, there are only two possible decay channels, namely with a sigma uh, plus back, or with a sigma minus process why is that? Well, um, this is simply because we put a magnetic field exactly along the direction of the KRT mode. So we cannot have any emission of high polarized photons in this direction. So these are the only two decay channels um, that we have. They have two different left garden coefficients, one over square root two and one over square root six. So the sigma plus decay is, is favored, it would be nicer if this is symmetric, of course, but this is in, in this level system uh, what nature um, basically uh, provides us with it. So we take the photons out, we take them uh, through a polarization controller, uh, where we basically, which we basically use to make the rest of the fiber coming out from through the vacuum chamber uh, to our detection setup to make this a quarter weight plate. And we put this on a, on a polarization uh, sensitive beam splitter, again, with <coughs> uh, the coins that is here. And then if the photon goes here, we see sigma plus. If the photon goes here, or sigma minus coming out from the fiber, from the, from the ion, sorry. And then we can measure these different rates um, and uh, then go back and measure, after we've detected this photon, we go back to our ion and basically measure whether the ion was in this state or was in this state. And this was this is done again with a short optical pumping pulse, so we shine in light, which has specifically only pi or sigma minus polarization which couples all these three states, but not this one, to the excited state manifold, then this decays down here by the emission of the 297 photon, and then we use the normal detection on the STP transition. And if we see something here, then the ion was in the up state, if this remains dark, the ion was in the up state. And this provides us then sort of with the, with the, with the measurement uh, that's required for the correlation, that when we see um, sigma plus polarized light, Coming, sorry, if you have minus polarized light out, then the ion is in this state, or if you see the plus polarized coming out light out, then the, um, the ion is in this state, 
and here's the basically the correlation visibility of this correlation. It's basically this is not yet 100%, um, and uh, sort of the, we would like to have this higher, but uh, we're, we're basically limited in this arrangement here by the orientation of this magnetic field with respect to the cavity axis. This, this provides, and this, this limits the fidelity of the optical pumping and the fidelity of, of the generation. But this is something that, that we can improve upon in the future. Okay, so this is basically the 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 whole characterization of the ion in the cavity. We see the correlations between the, the ion state and the, and the, the, the polarization. We've seen the photon efficiency with around 2%. The same is for absorption, so also 2% if we send light in uh, through the single mode fiber. This is symmetric. And uh, yeah, this is our light matter interface for uh, the atomic side. Oh, sorry, let me this. Sorry. Okay, so now we want to couple this to the, um, to the quantum. So what is that? Um, there are, of course, dozens of kinds of, of quantum dots uh, that you can uh, work with. So here we are, when I say quantum dot, I mean quantum dots in indium arsenide, uh, gallium arsenide uh, heterostructures. And the, the sample approximately looks like this. So you have a Bragg mirror down here, then you grow um, a layer of gallium arsenide, indium arsenide, gallium arsenide and make the table structure, and at this interface, uh, by, by self-assembly, there are these little islands forming, um, which are the dots. They have the sizes of a few nanometers, and um, you can then, uh, here, here are some electrodes, you can charge them, or you can work with the neutrals, you can either put the electrons on, or just work with them as neutrals, and the electrons are basically confined to these little islands. On top of the sample is then a solid immersion lens, which is then for the efficient uh, collection of the light coming out from the dots, um, and then this goes then out of the drive cell. So here is the picture of how the sample looks like. This is the solid immersion lens glued to the sample, and um, if you now do a broadband, above band gap excitation of this, and just look at your chip, you see all these little <coughs> glowing dots on there, and these are all uh, quantum dots. So all these little. Um, uh, Permit like um, shapes which emit light when they're optically excited. For each of them, you can show that these are single images by again recording the, the Hamper Brown twist the signal. This is for a pulse excitation, that's why you have these peaks here, but the important thing is that zero delay, um, there is no uh, Hamper Brown twist correlation, which shows that this is a single image. Now, the problem is that all of these are different from each other, right? You will probably not find any single, if not two quantum dots on the same sample which would interfere with each other because they all emit light um, at different frequencies. So what we now have to do is to find the one that works with our eye. Okay, before we come to that, here is sort of a, a short, very simple description of the physics um, of the optically excited um, quantum dots. So this is now what was before the vertical coordinate. So we have gallium arsenide, here's the, the valence band, here's the conduction band, that's the band gap. Then you have indium arsenide, which has a smaller band gap, and again gallium arsenide. So that's in the z direction the structure. And um, then uh, you get these quantum wells here. When there's no light uh, shown into this, nothing is really, uh, nothing is really happening here, um, because um, the balance band is basically filled and the production band is basically filled. Now what you do when you shine a light uh, as a resonant excitation, you can create a hole here in the, in the balance band and uh, a charge in the production band forming an exciton in the system. And uh, by the symmetry of the, of the problem or of the, of the underlying structure, the, structure, the, the um, electrons up here they form in an s orbital um, and the, the holes form in the p orbital. So, <coughs> taking together the, the orbital uh, um, uh, angular momentum, together with the spin um, of the electron, this gives you S1 half and, and J equals 3 half quantum numbers for, for electrons and holes. Now, you can combine them together. Now, by, by the internal structure of this, this, this heterostructure, 
um, these states they split um, in energy. Um, so uh, we can be only focused on those states which are near resonant, um, which are basically these four states that we can create, which are quantified by the total projection of angular momentum SZ plus JZ, and uh, these are go from two one minus one and zero. These are all the exciton states here. The ground state, of course, is zero excitation. So this is the state where there's nothing around. And now we have the standard uh, optical selection rules. Um, basically, the, the bright optic, the, the bright excitonic transitions, they happen from the ground state, to delta m equals one or delta m equals minus one um, transitions. And these are the two strong transitions. These transitions are here. Um, they're they're disfavored because we would change <coughs> the m quantum number by two units, which is not the, the, an electrically dipolar transition. So this is basically this is basically the, the level scheme that we're interested in in this point. The typical emission wavelength range um, of these types of dots is in the 900 nanometer range, and this is also the reason why we chose those because uh, the high universe is 935, um, as I showed you. So it, it's right in the middle. The other reason why um, these Indian gallium RZ quantum dots are, are nice is uh, because they have very, very good um, optical properties. So the radiative alignment um, of, the, of these exotonic states is on the order of 300 megahertz, so about 100 times as much as the, as the audio. Um, and uh, they're basically uh, Fourier limited by the light. So we have very little. Uh, emission of photons into phonon uh, um, sideband. Okay, these experiments are done with four Kelvin, but uh, nevertheless, the, the emission into in, into uh, um, phonon broadened uh, spectra is very low, so the order ten percent. They have magnetic field tuning. So you see, these are, these are basically uh, electrons here, and you have a standard tuning of around ten gigahertz per tesla. And with this, we can produce fine tuning um, of the resonance transition. Okay, so here's the setup. Um, the ion I've showed you already um, extensively. The quantum dot is in collaboration with the group of Mitch Atatur um, in Cambridge. It sits in, a, uh, sits in an optical cryostat uh, 4K in the field of 4 Tesla, which was sort of the field that was necessary to, to mesh the wavelengths of this one dot. Um, and then um, we basically excite the dot optically, resonantly, um, extract the photons, send them over through 15 meters of single mode fiber, and then couple them into the fiber that goes to the, the cavity of the ion, and we want to absorb then these photons with the single ion. So providing a direct single photon link from the quantum dot to, um, to the ion. Okay, so this works the following way. Um, so only one of these two solutions is resonant because they're, they're split up here a bit. Um, we, we, we send in here the excitation pulses, send the light over. The ion is prepared in this D state and uh, inside the cavity. And if this photon enters the cavity, it can pump the ion back down here. And uh, this provides us the herald for a single photon absorption event. So we then measure whether the fluorescence on this transition is present or not which tells us whether the ion is still here or whether this absorption process was successful. So the, the decay rate, so the branching ratio between these two is roughly 95 to 5. So we have 95% chance that this falls down here uh, and then <coughs> maybe it And uh, here's the, basically the sequence. And uh, here is the, the, the experimental data. So we see the, we measure the ion state transfer probability from this state to this state. Um, as a function of the, of the, the pulse length that we send um, onto the eye. And you see here that this increases. Um, and uh, you can extract basically the efficiency that we can convert this in, in the quantum dot photons which actually reach the eye in the cavity, which is shown up here. So this shows when, when around 100 or so um, quantum photons from the quantum dot actually reach the cavity, we get a very high, whatever, three quarters probability for, uh, for repumping the eye. So this is a, uh, an, an efficiency on the order of, of, of a percent or so. I will quantify this in more detail in a moment. But the, the, the basic message from this is um, this works. And now um, we can use the, 
iron basically is a very uh, delicate spectrometer for the quantum dot emission. So what you now do is um, you excite um, the quantum dot. So here the, the, the upper graph shows the theoretical emission spectrum from the quantum dot, where you see basically these three peaks, which is the, the center emission plus the model uh, peak side bands on the other side, where you have the quantum dot R. Um, then you get the, the model chirp that basically. And on top of that, you see the coherent scattering of the quantum dot. So this is basically Rayleigh scattering when you hit the quantum dot in the galactic Well, what is that role of the chirp? What, where does that physics come from? What's the... the this is when your, uh, when your Raman frequency, with which you drive the transition, becomes larger than the kind of thing line with. Oh, okay. okay. Um, <coughs> then you get the chirp that is in the, in the resonance right. resonant spectrum. Okay, so we have two contributions here. This is this you can the, the model chip that what is in this resonance resonance you basically can can regard as the incoherent scattering from the quantum dot so that's spontaneous emission from this let's say. And then on top of that we have the, the Rayleigh peak, um, which is a bit weird because it inherits the line width of the laser, but it's anti bunch tight because only you can only excite the quantum dot once per 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 line width. Okay, so this is, and then we can we can shift so the quantum dot spectrum with respect to the ion spectrum. So the ion is always fixed. That's the blue one. That's our receiver, basically, and the quantum dot is the sender. And we can shift by by the by the tuning mechanism we have for the dots. We can shift the spectrum across the ion and record the ion transfer probability um, as a function of this distance. And we see here that sort of this recovers very nicely the theoretical um, quantum dot spectrum. And in particular, we see here that um, we have this sharp increase um, with the coherently scattered photons. And um, this is uh, now exactly the point um, of the bandwidth match. Right? The, the coherently scattered photons have a line width that is inherited from the laser, which is a megahertz or two. So this has a, a bandwidth which interacts very well with the ion, which also has a bandwidth of a megahertz or two. And the quantum dot itself has a 300 megahertz line width. You see this roughly here. The center peak has something like 300 megahertz. And each of these model triplets, well, more or less, has also a few hundred megahertz. And um, for, for those, the interaction is suppressed. So the coherent scattering is really what, what, what boosts the rate for um, the interaction in this hypersystem between the, the dot and the, and the eye. And this makes us overcome the bank of mismatch to a to large factor. It's almost an order of magnitude. Why the model triplet on the left side um, this is what they call frequency pooling. Um, so basically, the, the, the quantum dot has um, a nonlinear response to the laser frequency that you drive it with. And um, it responds differently depending on whether you're slightly redly tuned or slightly blue tuned, and then the spectrum uh, skews a bit. This is, this is an intrinsic property of the quantum dot. Oh. Yes? I, I think I missed a point. So, is, is it possible? to change the resonant frequency of the ion, and is that what you're doing? No, the ion is always fixed. We, we shift the, the quantum dot emission spectrum across the fixed ion. But I thought that was um, also fixed. The quantum dot uh, spectrum that was just known, right? You know the electronic structure and their... No, no, the, the, the quantum dot can be tuned by electric fields, so by strain, can be tuned by magnetic fields, and can be tuned by the pump laser. Mm -hmm. So the, the, you this, can this get can, it to get whatever wave emission you want. Well, this is a, we sort of, we can do this over a two gigahertz bandwidth, right? If this tunes more than that, we don't see anything. And then this is so far away from the eye that there is basically no absorption. But once we've, once we've centered this one dot onto the, onto the ion mission, then we can tune it around by, by a gigahertz plus minus in each direction. Uh, but we cannot shift the ion by gigahertz. This would require to be applied 10 tesla to the ion, which we don't have available. So as a follow-up to her question, uh, on, in, in the two-level atom, the molar spectrum has a 3 to 1 ratio of the central to the side. Yes. Here it's not at all. Is it, again, one of these properties of the quantum Yes. yes. They, they behave only approximately as, as two-level systems. Okay. Uh, the, um, in sort of, in this modeling, sort of, let's put it this way, these line shapes um, for the dots, they, they are known in the quantum dot community. So people okay. understand why they're skewed, people okay. understand why these intensity ratios are like that. But this comes from the intrinsic properties 
okay. um, of, of, of the structure of the code. Okay. Why do you choose to use an organic field to tune the, the quantum dot? Why not use just a, a gain electrode to tune an electric field? Um, the, the, uh, the magnetic field, so th 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 they're both used. Um, so, but they serve slightly different purposes. The magnetic field is also necessary to pull the minus and the plus one state apart, so that we have really a two level system that we're talking to. Um, and uh, the, uh, I will come to the, to the charge quantum dots in a moment. They will have the, the problem stronger because they also have to pull the ground states apart. And we wanted to work basically roughly at the same setting for all the thoughts, so that's why everything happened at, at, at the same moment. But you're right, I mean, there, there, I mean, there, there, there are several tuning possibilities uh, for the dots that allow you to shift the dots uh, into resonance, and here it's a combination of both. Any more questions? Okay, so here is now um, the um, the, the spec, sort of the, the state transfer probability as a function of the quantum dot intensity. Um, and this has this, this weird behavior which puzzled us in the beginning a bit, that we get the highest uh, eigenstate transfer probability for the lowest drive powers of the dot. So for the lowest number of photons that we're actually um, creating from the dot. But if you think about the spectrum, this is quite uh, clear then why that is the case. So when you do go to the very low, um, power regime, so way below saturation intensity of the dot, then the emission spectrum of the dot is mainly coherently scattered photons. And they are absorbed very well by the ion. So there is very only a small background, which is the natural line. As you increase the drive power, then uh, you go to the regime where the model triplet becomes um, significant. And then the amount of photons of the dot are emitted goes up in total, but there's also more out here in these in these side bands, which are not directly absorbed uh, by the eye, and that's why we see we see this this behavior, um, and this fits with the with the model for the quantum dot emission uh, spectrum. So again, here is basically the, <coughs> the <coughs> sorry the message here basically is again um, that the the, the coherently scattered photons they help us a lot in combining these two systems as opposed to the to the incoherent scattered. Um, why do your error bars uh, decrease with the excitation intensity? Like, you have like, really big error bars that are just kind of Um, that's a good question. I don't know. I would presume that these are overall um, fewer, much fewer events because there's much less light much 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 fewer amount of photon coming from the from the dot to the ion. But the uh, this I can only speculate that actually this. Um, is there a particular reason why the scaling looks like what it does? Like more or less exponential decay or uh, it's a, no no it's not exponential, it's a it's a power law. It's a power uh, law. Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, this, this you can, I mean, sort of the, 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 the simple expression for this you can write down analytically, this, this works quite well, or you just sort of basically um, take into account what is the, what is the amount of, of uh, scattering that goes into the, into the incoherent scattering as compared to the, to the coherent scattering, which basically... Uh, it just happens just, to be... This goes so high up that, that, that this is basically constant, it's just proportional to laser intensity, and then the background comes up. states 
we can now prepare certain uh, spin mixtures in the ground state by optical pumping. So these, these two transitions, this transition and that transition, they're now split in, in energy by the, by the presence of the magnetic field. And by shining a pro pulse in here, we can then optically pump a population out here, which creates uh, an equilibrium mixture of the spin occupation in this ground state. And then you do the reverse process basically to read this out. This photon is emitted, and that's the photon that we take out and send over um, to the eye. And the amount of photons that we're getting out from here is basically uh, proportional to the, uh, <coughs> the spin mixture that we have initially prepared in the class. So for, for, a certain, for, for, for a low imbalance, we get few photons. For high imbalance, we get many photons. Then we send this over to the, to the ion. And uh, here we do now the, the, the same preparation that we talked about earlier. We prepare the ion now in a specific um, spin state over here, uh, in the down state. We send then our, uh, our sigma plus polarized photon in and measure the absorption probability um, on this transition. And then we see that this absorption probability that we see on the ion, um, this one, is uh, directly correlated with the uh, spin mixing or the, the projection of the spin state in the uh, ground state of the quantum wave. So with this we can basically transfer classical information um, from the quantum dot ground state to the uh, internal state um, of the ion that we did after. So the correlation coefficient here is almost uh, essentially unity, basically, and we can go up to around um, 80%. Okay, so we can we can transfer this uh, as that um, correlations basically we, at the moment we cannot do this yet for for the uh, for the transverse uh, polarizations um, which is basically limited by the fact that uh, it's very difficult to read out these quantum dots fast enough to actually measure to, rot to prepare the spin mixture rotate and measure on a different basis so this, this speed uh, at the moment in this dots not available but this could of course be extended and then it would be nice uh, to see whether we can actually entangle the, the spin of the quantum dot with, uh, with the spin state um, of the ion. Are you using a pulse laser on the quantum dot, or is this the end of uh, these, are, these are pulses which are created with the so these are around nanosecond, three nanoseconds, between one and three nanoseconds. Um, I know, I mean, I've had my mobile gears, or in the hopes of Yamamoto, I think, they have done experiments with, with picosecond pulse lasers, and then they have the, the required speed. Uh, to see the spin photon entanglement uh, in dots. But uh, at the moment, we don't have the technical uh, ability to do that. All right, um, this is about it. Uh, here's a short summary uh, what I showed you today, sort of, I you can do the live meta interfaces with the ion and the single photon, um, and then we can use this then to connect really a single emitter in the solid state via a single photo to a single atomic emitter um, uh, for the first time. And um, yeah, and then we can transfer classic information uh, from one uh, to the other system. And uh, so this is my last lecture, so let me finally thank uh, all the people in the group who did this experiment and make all of that possible, and uh, also the, the, the people who support us um, with money. And yeah, thank you for your attention.
because this takes time, right? If you add additional interrogation steps in between, this limits the, your excitation rate because you have to measure. So if you can get rid of the error thing altogether, it would be nice. Would you do that? Sorry? Say so you can increase that by two third seconds? No. What are you doing there? Um, better cavities. So with a clone dot, um, one way that people read out these you know, transverse magnetizations is that you can destroy the rotation. Is that something that you guys have thought about trying to do? Because it they do fairly rotate with single photons? No. Okay, no, I don't know this. Oh, no, 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 no. Not with single photons. Ah, okay. Yeah, you know, they use a beam, but it's dispersive. So they, they, the idea is that there's no absorption of that, right? So they detune, and, and, and so they can use a lot of photons. Enough to measure. It's a kind of almost yes. a non demolition measure. It's not quite, but it's weaker. And so you can actually get, you can measure, and it's directly sensitive to transverse magnetization. Uh, we haven't thought about this, but uh, this, I guess, I'll try that this. One would, yeah. One would have to time this, of course, very carefully. Right, because yeah. the, the photons from this, they should not go to the eye. So, so people typically use Pump Pro, right? So they, yes. so, anyway, you, you can, there's lots of papers. You can okay, okay, thanks.